especially New Mexico, amen, and so um, just uh, great uh, things God wants to do in our lives, amen. I want to let you know tonight, that this morning, amen, that my intention is not to uh, insult anyone or to offend you, but if you if you do feel offended or a bit uh, uh, strained, amen, then if this is not my intention, it might just be, amen, uh, God, amen, <laughs> dealing with our hearts, and um uh, I don't know if any one of you have ever heard stories, maybe you've been in a situation where the wife and a husband is standing or sitting before their pastor or a counselor, and the wife is in tears and saying, my husband there, he doesn't love me anymore. And the husband is like, are, are, what are you talking about? Are you kidding? Of course I love you, you idiot. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And so he's totally clueless. In his mind, of course I love you. That's why, that's why I bring home the money. That's why I say it all. <laughs> to him, it's perfectly logical. And, uh, you know, the same goes, amen, when you talk about people that love God. You go on the street, you can have people that, that they say they love God, and, and they're absolutely, amen, they don't go to church. They're hooked on drugs, they're sleeping with their girlfriend, they're having kids out of wedlock, hello, you know. And uh, what you want to say to them, wait a minute, no, you don't love Jesus. And how can, oh my God, how can you say, yeah, I don't love Jesus? The Bible says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Of course you don't love Jesus. I mean, but but to the, the audacity... To say that uh, someone that does not love Jesus is almost unacceptable. Even in, the, in, the, in these four walls, amen, the question is, amen, not, maybe, maybe the question is not, do you love Jesus? But maybe the question should be, how much? And this is a question that needs to be asked to every person, every person that comes to Jesus Christ. And this is a question that in our lives needs to be answered from us personally and this morning. We need to answer this question. In my text of John 21, I'm not going to read the whole story. But there's some things in the Bible that I don't understand. Maybe you could... Relate with me on this because, you know, here uh, you go through, you're, you're a disciple, you go through three years with Jesus, you're watching him multiply bread, you're watching him raise the dead, you're watching him, uh, you know, heal the sick, uh, you, you're, you yourself are walking on water, 
You're part of miracles. You're seeing demons as a, you're sent out to two by two into cities. You're watching the dominion that you have. I'm, we're talking about uh, 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 all of this was leading to one thing, wasn't it? It was all leading to the uh, to the crucifixion. It was all leading, uh, amen, to to where these uh, these people, these disciples, had to come to a place where they they really realized that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He was the answer to all of their their uh, their prayers. He's the answer to their historically, uh, amen, uh, you know, religious uh, appetite to have a Messiah. He was Jesus Christ. And many of the disciples declared, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. Nathaniel said, uh, uh, you are, uh, uh, you, you are certainly, amen, uh, the Son of God. Right? They're in this boat that's about to be capsized. And uh, Jesus gets in the boat. And after walking on water, he gets in the boat and he, and he speaks to the wind and the seas and it calms down. And the Bible says that the, the disciples were in awe and said to themselves, surely this is the Son of God. Right? That was the point. The point was to, to come to a point where Amen. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, if I asked everybody here, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, you'd say yes. If I asked everybody here, whether you're hooked on uh, meth or you're a drunk or you're a, 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 you know, a closet pornographer, amen, you, you would tell me you love Jesus. I, 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 of course I love Jesus. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know my heart. Right? And so uh, you and I realize there's an interesting story. Jesus, Jesus has done all this. I mean, I mean, uh, how much more would convince you? All right, Lazarus raised from the dead, uh, children raised from the dead. Uh, you, you know, you, your wife, amen, healed in a moment. I mean, it just, it's just amazing. Amen? All these miracles. And so here it is. Uh, Jesus dies on the cross. Uh, they all run like a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, scared puppies. Uh, and then run behind all these locked doors. Uh, Judas, amen, he's, he's, uh, he betrayed Jesus. And you got Peter who denies him, right? I don't know this guy. Wait a second, you're, you, you're one of his disciples. No, I don't know this guy. And he literally curses him and says, yeah, I, I, I bleep and he bleep, you know, I, I, I'm telling you, I don't know the guy. Right? <laughs> and so Jesus raises from the dead. If it were, all that stuff wasn't enough, Jesus raises from the dead. He's the Messiah. Is there any questions? Now, you get this. You're a disciple. You're on the inner circle. You've known this. It's not like you heard about him. You, you know this guy. You've lived with him for three years. You, 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 you've been running from the Jews. You've been running from the Romans. You, you, you were there when they, when they got him at the garden. I mean, you, you intimately, you know this guy. Thomas says, I don't believe it. Right? Not until I thrust my hand into his eye. How much like disciples we are. Huh? Amen. You know? And so Jesus walks through, the, walks through the wall or the door. He doesn't open it, the Bible says. He appears before the disciples in our text, just before I'm going to read. And he, he appears to them, and uh, he's risen from the dead. And he looks at Thomas and says, Thomas, uh, don't be unbelieving, but believe me. Here is my side. Put your hand in my side and in my scars. Uh, and, 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 and Thomas is looking uh, at Jesus, and all he can say is, my Lord, my God. <laughs> So you get this idea that Thomas finally got it, right? Oh, some of us would say, "Dude, are you?" It would be awesome, right? But it's it, it just like the penny dropped. You're standing before the Messiah. Now let me ask you something: If you if you had 
Uh, if you know the Messiah and he's risen from the dead and he's, and he's and you've rented a, a VRPO da, down by the beach uh, and you're staying with him uh, and uh, you know you're, this, is, this is the last days that he's going to be around. He, he says he's got to leave and send the comforter and you know that he's going to disappear somehow. He's going to be gone and so you, ha you don't know how long it's going to be. You know, he's, uh, God is always keeping us. Uh, amen. Uh, no man knows the day or the hour. Amen. Because he knows us. He knows we would wait till the, the last minute, amen, and then we'll repent and then to sneak ourselves into heaven. He, he knows him. So here they are. They're, 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 they, this is Jesus, the guy that you heard about your whole life, the Messiah. He's coming. He's all this stuff. And so one morning, Peter, or one afternoon, Peter decides, hey, I go fishing. Now, I can't, I don't know the scene, but I can imagine maybe Jesus. He's glorified, he's walking through water, but he's, he is eating. So maybe he's taking a nap. I don't know what, I don't know what Jesus is doing with that. But Peter says, you know what, I'm going to go fishing. Let me ask you a question. You're with the Messiah, you don't know when he's going to disappear. And you're going to go fishing? I got to blow my mind. And not just Peter, but they all said, hey, I'm going with you, man. Hey, man, grab your tackle. Let's go. And so they go out on the sea and they go fishing. Now, this, this is where we pick up this story because as, uh, as you realize, they're on the seashore. And there's a man on the seashore. And they've been out all night long like the disciples. Uh, hey, man, they fished all night long. And guess what they caught? Nothing. Zeho. <laughs> Nothing. Sounds familiar? They're out all night long. I don't know why they call this fun, but I don't understand the mind of a fisherman. Maybe there's some fishermen here. You don't. You, you say, man, you just don't understand. So here, here they are. They, they and they see this guy. They don't know who he is, but they see this man on the on the on the seashore, and he's uh, standing there by a fire with some uh, uh, fish uh, uh, on the on the fire. And he says, "Children, uh, uh, have you caught any fish?" No, we've been all night long. He said, well, cast your net on the other side, on the right side. Now, this has got to sound familiar. Right? right. First time Jesus met uh, Peter and, and all the other fishermen. Amen. This is the exact scenario. Amen. I didn't catch anything. Uh, cast your net on the, on the other side and, he ca and fish. And so, sure enough, they cast the net out. Uh, all night long, they've been fishing. They're going back to the shore. These fish, especially big fish, the Bible says there are over 500 big fish, uh, amen, that jumps into this net. Big, they don't hang out near the shore. But miracle of miracles, and John and Peter know, amen, this is the Messiah. They know it. See, they're looking at each other, amen. Uh, and so you see uh, Peter, he, he puts on his clothes, he's, uh, uh, and, he, and he jumps in the, and, and, he, he, and this is where we get that song, Come and Dine. Amen. Come to come to Jesus. Come and dine. And so here you and I see this scene. The disciples come up to the shore, and Jesus has fish, and they have breakfast together. In verse fifteen, the Bible says, "So when they eat and breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these?" Now let me stop here because. Now, there's a few guys here. Let me ask you, do, does this sound like something you would do after a, a, a day of hunting or fishing? Sit down with the guys and say, hey, you love me. <laughs> yeah, no, no, women may be different. I don't know. I mean, women go to the bathroom together. I don't get it. But, hey, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if women sit down and say, honey, do you love me? I love those shoes. Oh, of course I love you, sweetie. You know, maybe that's a thing. But let me tell you, men don't do that. That's not a common question. Hey, you, you love me? Maybe you're an emo. You know, maybe, maybe you're a, 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 a new woke, uh, a young, uh, uh, emotional uh, person, and, and maybe that's a thing you do. But Jesus, uh, Jesus was a man's man. Jesus, he, he, he was courageous, man. He, he never backed up. I do not believe that this was a question, amen, that, that this would happen in a, in a normal fishing hunt, fishing a, or a hunting trip. Amen. Do you love me? Now, that there, there's a reason why Jesus asked this question. And there's a reason why Jesus 
will ask you the same question. It's interesting to me that God wants to know from your lips. And don't, don't, don't do this. Uh, oh, you know my heart, Lord. Shut up. Okay, that's, that's not going to fly. Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me more than these? More than what? Well, there's two things he could be referring to. Do you, do you love me more than this pile of fish? you got to realize that that was a mother load of fish. That was like a modern day business opportunity. To start your own and get back in the business of fishing like a, it was before you gave, a, you, you gave three years to Jesus. He's giving him a, a ticket back to the old life and back to his father's fishing. Uh, he could buy a boat. He could go to the market. And, and, and this is a, a, do you love me more than your business opportunity? Do you love me more than your job? Do you love me more than material goods? Do you love me more than your two-car garage or your house or your, or your, your four-wheel drive or your, uh, your magnum? Do you love me more? It's interesting to me that God, God asks a man, God asks a man, do you love me? And you know, God does know his heart. How many know that? He knows his heart. But you've you got to realize something here. God was kneeling. The other, the other thing was uh, that there were, there were disciples. These guys, uh, these guys were bros. They were, they were, they were uh, uh, brothers. Amen. There was a, a love, a bond between these guys after three years of traveling around and, uh, you know, bleeding and eating and sleeping and, uh, you know, sacrificing together and, and being pushed around and, and seeing the glory of God. And, and so these guys, amen, there was a bond there. There was a brotherhood there. And maybe Jesus was asking Peter, do you love me more than these guys? Do you love me more than this person, this, 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 these relationships? I passed it a long time, man, and I, I, I learned something, amen. Sometimes blood is thicker than water, man. You lose one, you lose them all. I knew that one growing up in a little town full of Mexicans, man. You don't fight one, you fight the whole family, amen. <laughs> You offend grandma, and you lose the whole the whole family. Do you love me more? Can you make a stand? You know, and this is as a missionary, I speak out of experience. Hey Amen. This is what you're asking uh, these people in a different culture to do. Do you love me more than your culture, more than your uh, more than uh, your, your your religion? Do you love me more than these earthly relationships? Amen. Right. He asked him, do you agape me more than these? In other words, this is the word agape means a uh, 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 God kind of love, a love without limits, a love without out any kind of uh, repayment, a love that has no, uh, 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 there's no uh, stipulations. And he says, do you agape me more than these? And, and Peter, amen, he says, uh, Lord, yes, I do. And then Jesus takes another bite of fish, another gulp of coffee. I'm sure it was coffee. I don't think it was tea. <laughs> and then he looks at Simon again and says, Simon Barjona, agapio. Agapio me. Does he, do you love me? Agapio with a God kind of love. Peter looks at him again, and you've got to realize in their culture, you know what, whenever, whenever you know, they, they repeat something, what they're doing is they're putting an exclamation point. That's why the Bible says, verily, verily, I say to you. In other words, an exclamation point. Listen, pay attention. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, right? Pay attention. This is important. So Jesus looks at him and says, uh, do, you, uh, do you love me with a God kind of love? You know that I do. What he said, Lord, you know that I love you, right? And then he asked him again. So he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? Phileo is, is a friendship. Let me ask you a question. 
When it was asked and I began to contemplate it, it was profound. Can you, can you love something but not really like it? Can you love something but not really like it? Jesus says, do you love me? I love you. I love you. I mean, this is the most profound kind of love. I love you intimately. I love you with all of my heart. Do you even like me? Of course I love you, Jesus, but I love fishing too. I don't know, the thought occurred to me, you know, Jesus is here with his guys. He's about to go and ascend into heaven. You'd think they would be all over him, asking him questions. What do we do? How is this going to work? And, and what, you know, all these uh, eternal truths. Uh, but they, they go fishing instead. I'm like, really? I can't believe, amen, that we would have church and Christians won't come. Do you even like me? Well, I love God, but I don't really like church all that much. I think I'd rather uh, stay home and watch uh, whatever's on. Excuse me? It's always baffled me. Amen. Now, like I said, uh, this is not my goal to offend you, but you've got to think about this. Because you've got to look at the context of why Jesus is asking this question. He's asking this question not because this is what guys do. Don't worry. Your husband's not out there after humping a hunter trip asking his friends, hey, do you love me? It's just not going to happen. Probably not. If he does, I would begin to worry about him, okay? He needs some deliverance. But Jesus was asking him because there's a, a thread that he's pulling on. There's a part that God created man in his image. God created man in his image. And there's one thing. The most powerful thing in the Bible that caused the Father to give the Son the ultimate, amen, he was trying to teach Abraham this on that story the pastor was talking about. He says, kill your son, your only son. And he, he had the incredible, amen, love for God. That, that was the only way to ex explain it, man, to believe uh, that God loves him so much he could plunge a knife in his son. And he tells his servant, we'll be back. Both of us are going to be back. That's why he's the father of faith, because he got this something and had pulled that thread. And there's something about, amen, the greatest thing, the greatest motivator on the world. You know what it is. That thread is love. I mean, man, uh, will give their lives uh, because uh, if at home invasion, they'll, they'll go out to amen in a blaze of glory. Amen, because they love their family. Any woman would give their life for their children. Amen. Right? It's a, you don't even have to ask. We have soldiers giving their life for their country. You have a people giving their life for the, what they believe. Uh, they're blowing themselves up and everybody else. You have, you have people neglecting every, every relationship in their whole life. Why? Because they love money. Love is the greatest motivator. Love is the greatest endurer. Love, amen, endures. Love, amen, true love. And this is what you and I, you begin to realize in the context of this question... Jesus was asking, he was pulling on that thread. There is a part of you, Peter. There's a part of you, disciples. Uh, there's a part of you that are sitting here in this place, amen, that God wants to pull a thread and say, do you love me? Did you read this story? Peter was offended. He was grieved in verse number... 17, Peter was grieved because he said to the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my sheep. Now listen to this. Come here, Peter. Most assuredly, I, came to, I, I say to you that when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. Well, when you're old, you shall stretch out your hands and another will gird you and you will, you will carry you where you do not wish. I don't know exactly what that means. But he, he clarifies it. Verse number 19. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. You know, somebody said, when Jesus died on the cross, he took away all your wrongs. 
But he also took away all of your rights. Massive amounts of people come to Jesus. And they get up from an altar and they change their lives. They quit going to the bar. They quit uh, uh, hanging out with these uh, wrong people. They quit doing uh, drugs. Amen. They change occupations. They, they start going to church. Uh, they go into prayer. They start fasting for God. They start to, uh, looking different. Amen. They cut their hair. They, all kinds of things happen, right? Because uh, they gave their life to Jesus Christ, right? Why would they do that? What do, do you have a pat? You know, I mean, I'm being a pastor of thirty some years. Uh, I know I, there's a lot of things I like to tell people. Where were you? You know what I mean. But you can't. Why don't you come to church more often? These guys come and say, hey, Pastor, man, I really enjoyed church this morning, man. Oh, well, gosh, I miss it, man. I know it's been a couple of weeks, man. I really love to be in the house of God. Why, why, why don't you come more often if you like it so much, right? Liar. I mean, we don't say that. <laughs> that we wait for to go in the office, or we say it under our breath, like, "Yeah, right." Yeah, you don't come to church. You don't. You don't serve God. You don't pay your tithes. You don't. You don't help us in outreach. Uh, amen. You. You. You're not. You don't volunteering for any kind of service for the church. Amen. You. You. You come in here. Amen. You. 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 You might throw your token buck or two in, and you leave. Amen. And you expect me to be thankful for you. I had a guy come to church, and, amen, and he was kind of late, and I wasn't picking on him. I mean, he just comes in, and I said, hey, man, and I happened to look at my watch. And I wasn't like, you know, you know that, was, that wasn't the thing. I just happened to look at my watch, and he came in late, and he says, oh, Pastor, you're lucky I'm even here. And I said, hey, buddy, you're lucky we're here. And I'll tell you something. You need the church. A whole lot heck of a more more than we need you. Amen. You ever have a boss tell you, hey buddy, you know I can replace you in a heartbeat. You're stepping over the line. Jesus is telling Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I mean, twice is enough. The third, the third time, now he's offended. He's not even asking him, do you love me with a God kind of love? He says, do you even like me? You know, I'm sure they're wives, uh, amen, that can relate to this. Uh, amen, you have a husband that says he loves you, but he's always out with the guys. He's out hunting, he's out fishing, he's uh, doing work, he's in the garage, he's in his man cave. It's like, I thought well, he might love me, but he sure doesn't like to be around me. Well, this is only for your consideration. <laughs> I didn't come here to offend you. Well, I will tell you something. The, the reason why Jesus asked him is because he was about to leave. And these men were not going to see Jesus in the flesh ever again. I'll give you the story. I'm an evangelist, so I'm gone for two weeks at a time, and I'll come home after the third week. And I really don't know all the things that happens in those two weeks. And so I, I come home. And I pull up to in my driveway, and lo and behold, there's a nice late model Toyota Camry sitting there. Beautiful car, and I'm, I'm like, wow, I wonder who's visiting. So I go in the house, and I go in the kitchen where normally visitors are, in the living room. I'm like, where, where, where is everybody, right? So it was a little condominium, so I go upstairs to the bedroom, and I, I go to my bedroom, and there's my wife sitting in a little comfy chair reading a book, and a... I come in, and I'm like, I'm about to ask her a question. She goes, hi, babe. Do you love me? <laughs> that, that's not a question you hear every day. And I'm like, yeah. I bought a car when you were gone. I said, okay. <laughs> All right. Would it be nice if I had a decision I could you know, do? Something. My own question was how much, but I began to realize what she was doing, not, not viciously or even being manipulative. She, she said those words, and what it did was it, 
It brought all of our history. It brought all uh, from the day that I laid my eyes on her, the day I fell in love with her, uh, the, when we got married, the ministry, kids, uh, hospitals, emergency rooms, uh, heartbreaks. Uh, and she brought our whole, our whole relationship with 30 plus years uh, into one statement, amen, when she asked me that question, she's asking me, do I love her? And I said, yes. How much of the payment? <laughs> <laughs> what was she doing? I began to realize what she was doing was she was, she was using our relationship, my relationship to her, my emotional relationship to her as collateral. Jesus may have asked this question to his disciples, and, and I believe he's asking us, uh, even this morning, do you love me, amen, enough to die for me? Jesus uh, asked Peter, do you love me? Do you even like me? He says, yes, I do. You know that I do. He's offended. Come on, gee, God, what are you talking about? And he says, all right, let me come here a little closer, because I'm going to tell you how you're going to glorify my name. You're not going to do what you want. C.T. Studd was like the, you know, the O.J. Simpson, the, the Kobe Bryant. He was like, the, he was like this uh, incredible athlete of his day in cricket. He was like the man, millionaire. I mean, the whole nation, ooh, and awe over this uh, C.T. Studd, man. He was, he was very famous, and he took advantage of his wealth. He, he did everything under the sun. He made statements. I, I've, I've enjoyed every pleasure, amen, that, that, that sin will allow. This guy had the money, he had the means, he, he was popular, he was famous. But one day he was reading in the Bible, because back then they used to read the Bible. And he was reading the Bible, and he, the story was about the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler said, uh, you know, I want to, I want to be like you. I want, I want eternal life. I want to know the life of God. I want to be like you, Jesus, basically. And Jesus says, well, you know, uh, keep the commandments. And, you know, whatever, just keep the commandments, do good, you'll be all right, you know, shut up, just get out of my face kind of thing. And he says, you know what, I do keep the commandments. From my youth up, I've kept the commandments, but I'm still, you know, I, I want to know how to be like you. I mean, you're a powerful, here's this rich young ruler, man, just like a C.T. Stud. And, and, and Jesus said to him, you really want to be like me? You really want to know eternal life? Sell everything that you have. Come and follow me. The Bible says he walked away sorrowful because he had a lot of stuff. C.T. said he reads this. He's about to get married to a woman. So he's wrestling with this and he's, this is convicting him. So he sells 90% of everything that he has. He gives it away to charity. He gives it to churches. He gives it to missions. And so there he is. He gives 90% of it away. And, and now the time comes to tell his fiance, hey man, I'm not as wealthy as I used to be. I only got about 10%. So she go, he goes to her and tells her, hey, you know, I read the story in the Bible, and you know what, I got convicted, and I, I really want to change, and I need to be right with God, and so I, I sold 90% of everything I have, I, I'm sorry. And she says, wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say he sold everything? To, he told that rich man to sell everything? So they went and they sold the other 10%, they got rid of the 10%, they gave it away. They landed in Shanghai, China, after they got married. He said he had a five pound note in his pocket. Let me ask you something, who could ask a man to do that? His pastor, could I ask you to do that? Brother, I heard you have a, an extra plot of land. Uh, it's probably worth about 30, 30 grand or, or 300 grand now these days. $150,000, um, uh, could you sell that and give it to the church? What would you do? What are you doing? You have no right. You can't ask me to do that. What's your problem, right? But Jesus can. Can't he? You see, what, what you and I realized, Jesus was coming to his disciples because, you know what, I don't know who's going to survive here. 
I don't know who's going to survive. I don't know if you're going to make it all the way to heaven. Right now you may see you love Jesus, but you know maybe the demands of Christianity are going to be a little too hard. Or maybe it gets a little boring. Or maybe you get distracted. Or maybe you get a job offer and it distracts you. You go away. Maybe you get a diagnosis and you get discouraged. And you say, God, where are you? You, How come I have this uh, this bra? And you, 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 you... I want to say that word, but I'm not going to say a bad word. <laughs> and, and you get all, all, all messed up and you leave the church. I don't know how many of you are going to do that. Happens all the time. Why? Did God disappoint them? No, because, you know, it was this issue right here. There's that string that God was pulling on. Do you love me? Do you, do you even like me? You know, the one regret Billy Graham said before he died, he said, the one regret I have in life, that I didn't spend more time with Jesus. I didn't fellowship with God. Billy Graham. Do you love me? You know what it is? It's a measure of God's credibility in your life. Does he have equity in your life? I didn't hesitate. Pastor asked me to go to, to Africa. Didn't hesitate twice. Didn't hesitate. You know why? It wasn't because I love Pastor Mitchell. I would do a lot for Pastor Mitchell. I did love Pastor Mitchell. But I did it because God has credibility with me in my life. He can ask anything. He knows that. There are people here. You, you love God that way. I don't care. God ask anything. See, if you're going to make it, Christian, if you're going to make it in convert, theology, uh, uh, all of the tricks of the Christian world, you know, all the little uh, bells and whistles and horns and all the stuff, that, all the trappings of Christianity, none of that will do you any good unless you love Jesus Christ. Amen. And I found out something, too. God loves me. Let me read this and we'll close. In 1844, King Herod ordered that James the Greater be thrust through with a sword, and he was the first apostle to be martyred and go, uh, so the bloodbath began. Luke was hung by the neck from the olive tree in Greece. Doubting Thomas was pierced with a, sp a pine spear and tortured with red hot plates and burned alive in India. In 1854, the proconsul of Heropolis had Philip tortured and crucified because his wife was converted to Christianity while he listened, while she listened to Peter preach, or, or Philip preach. Philip continued to preach while he was on the cross. Matthew was stabbed in the back in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was flogged to death in Armenia. James the Just was thrown off the southeast pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. After surviving a hundred foot fall, he was clubbed to death by a mob. Simon the Zealot was crucified by the governor Cyrene. Judas Thaddeus was beaten to death uh, with sticks in Mesopotamia. M Matthias, uh, or Math M Matthias uh, who replaced Judas Iscariot, was stoned to death and then beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down at his own request. John the Beloved was the only disciple who died of natural causes, but that's only because he survived his own execution. When a cauldron of boiling oil would not kill John, Emperor Diocletian uh, exiled him to the island of Patmos where he lived until his death in AD 95. Not one, not two, not six. Every disciple did, did not relent. Not one of them renounced Christ. Everyone went to the devil. What, what's, what's in a person Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world. This is a modern article. According to a Christian think tank, the Center for the Study of Global Christianity says 900,000 people, Christians have been martyred in the last decade, equating to 90,000 a year, equating to every six minutes. Do you love me? You know, probably none of us here are going to be martyred for Christ. They're not boiling oil down in the, in the square or burning witches in Silver City, are they? 
But God wants to know what kind of equity he has in your heart. Even to come to church. Instead of, I work, I've got to work at 5 in the morning, i got to get up at 4. I'm, oh my God, I can't come to church at 6. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Right? We're such... <laughs> what he's thinking. <laughs> We're so much like the disciples. We can see that we know it's true. It's not that we know it's true. It's like that guy, Jesus said, all things are possible if you only believe. Do you believe? And he says, yes, I believe. Help my unbelief. Wait a minute, do you believe or not? God wants to ask the question. You need to answer the question. Maybe it's not do you love God because everybody here is going to say they do. You love God more than these. Do you even like Him? I want you to bow your head. This morning, God is dealing with hearts and lives. Maybe you've never considered the love of God and how He died for you on the cross and rose again to forgive all of your sins and all of the acts that you have committed that have violated people and violated. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you enter into a relationship with Him, He'll forgive you of all your sins and all, all of your unrighteousness. Amen. God, God will forgive you because He died on the cross. He paid the price. He loves you. And what He's asking you to do is to love Him back. All He wants you to do is, is to, amen, repent from your sin. Turn. From your wicked ways and the things that you know that are unrighteous and, and to come to him. And I'll tell you something. Jesus is the easiest. I, I guess I'll call him a being. But he's the easiest thing in this world to fall in love with. Because he loves you with an unconditional love. He forgives you. He gives you mercy. He gives you grace. He gives you a judgment. He gives you correction. He, he, he talks to you. He walks with you. He'll be with you. To, this morning, let me tell you something. He loves you enough that He won't keep you the same. And there are people here you're not right with God. And maybe you do love God in your own way. But God is asking you, do you love me enough to do some things that you don't want to do? Do you love me enough to cast away the sin that so easily besets you? Do you love me enough to turn your back on your culture, who you are. Are you willing, amen, to die in a sense to yourself and come to Jesus? That's where God is asking you to come. A lot involved in that tonight, amen. But I'll tell you what, you know in your heart you need, you need something, you need a guide, you need God to make himself real to you. You're here this morning, God is dealing with You lift up your hand. And I guarantee you, Jesus Christ, amen, he will come into your heart and you'll never be the same. He can change you in ways that are so profound that there won't be words that can describe it. Some of you know what I'm talking about, but there are those, amen, you're not right with God. Your back's going to lift up your hand. Maybe you're on live stream this, this morning and you know what? God is dealing with your heart. You say, Pastor... How can you question my love for God? Well, it's very easy. I didn't give you the litany of scriptures. Jesus questioned everybody's love all the time. You love me? Keep my commandments. Keep my word. You only came here for fish and loaves. You don't love me. You don't even like me. You're here for the bennies. And this morning, God is dealing with you because you're not right with God. Maybe you're religious. Maybe you got all the religious garb. But I'll tell you something. Do you love God enough to say no to sin? To say yes to Him? Let me turn my attention to Christians. These guys had been with Jesus three years. They would seen more in those three years that you and I have seen in our whole lives. Kids raised from the dead. Lazarus raised from the dead. People healed. Uh, we're talking about terminal diseases. Amen. Absolutely wiped out in a moment's time. Leprosy healed by the power of God. We're talking about miracles of 
weather, miracles of material goods. We're talking about food. I mean, the list goes on, right? I mean, they've seen it all. And though, even they, they had to be asked this question. Do you love me more than these? He said, yes, three times. I do love you. I, yeah, matter of fact, I do like you. I like being around you. I like being in your presence. I like, I like everything about you. Then come here. Because I'm going to tell you how you're going to glorify my name. And for Peter, that meant the way he was going to die. And how he was going to grow old. I don't know how you're growing old. I don't know how you're going to die. But let me tell you something. Every saint, amen, glorifies God. God loves the death of his <coughs> saints. Why? Because a saint's life and death will glorify him. And tonight, I don't care how bad your life is. I don't care how struggling you are. I don't, I don't know what's in your past. I don't even know what's going on in your life right now. But I do know one thing. Love Jesus with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And all the, all the commandments of God will be fulfilled in that one. And I'm telling you something, God will guide you. He'll help you through sickness, through diagnosis, through uh, poverty, through job loss, through challenges. He'll help you as you give up everything to live for Jesus. And maybe you're going to be a missionary in some far off place. Maybe you're going to sell everything that you have to do that. I'm telling you, that's not as hard as it sounds. As a matter of fact, it's liberating. When I sold my house, I got out of debt. I sold everything I had went to, with bags over to Africa, one of the most liberating things I ever did, to, despite, amen, all the things that God did. Man, I tell you, I was out of debt. I was a rich man. And there are people here. It's unthinkable. Pastor can't ask you to be at church every service. Pastor can't ask you to come to prayer. Pastor can't ask you to be with him in outreach. And Pastor can't ask you to give over and above for a missionary work and for supporting a church or paying off something that, that we need. On and on and on it goes. But I, I've been there. But you, we can't ask you. All we can do is plead with God, amen, to deal with your heart. Do you love him enough to empty your bank account? Sell all that you have. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you, Jesus is asking this question. Let's pull on that thread. What kind of credibility do, do I have in your life? Because if, if he has that kind of credibility, nothing will separate you from the love of God. Not persecution, not poverty, nothing in this world. All right? And God is dealing with hearts. If we could stand, amen, in this place, you can just make it one motion as you stand. You just come to this altar, amen. Let's begin to deal with God, amen. My, my relationship with God is a, is, is a love affair, amen. That's as simple as it is. It is. How do you survive uh, the end times? How are you going to survive uh, an em economic uh, uh, meltdown? How are you going to survive the rising? Uh, uh, we don't know how much tribulation. Jesus said, when you see these things come to pass, uh, amen, this is the beginning of sorrows. Woe unto them uh, that have child in that day. I mean, it, it, on and on and on. We know it's going to get bad before it gets worse. Uh, and tonight, amen, how are we going to do that? Well, it's easy. Fall in love with Jesus, man. Depend on him. He loves you back. Amen. He's proven his love for you. Amen. And this, that Christ uh, has proved his love for us, that he died on the cross for us. Amen. And God, amen. It, it's not that, that we love him. It's that he loved us first, that he is able to take care of us. He cares about us more than uh, uh, all the animals in the world. He, he cares about us uh, more than anything else. And I'll tell you tonight, he can provide. Uh, he works on his own economy. He works on his own. Uh, amen. Can you imagine the churches uh, through the pandemic, the churches uh, thrived. Amen. They got more money than when they were before the pandemic. Amen. Because God was showing us, uh, you don't need, uh, amen. You don't need to depend on the world. Uh, you don't need to worry about, amen, economics. Uh, amen. God, amen. He so supersedes, uh, amen. Than your diagnosis. Uh, he's bigger than your problems. Uh, he's bigger than your disease. Uh, he's bigger than, uh, amen, the conflict you have. He's, bi he's bigger than the fear that you have in your heart uh, and the unforgiveness. Uh, you need to let it go, man. Let God, amen, uh, say, you know, you know what, God, I love you. I love you. And if you love Jesus, you're going to be like Abraham. You're going to be willing to, 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 to destroy even the very thing that you love for God. Why would anyone do that. Why would any man, why would any father do that to the son? 
Because there's a love for God that is greater than the love of this human being, this son that you bore. Because he knew it was God. He was God that provided that young man. Tonight or this morning, amen, God is dealing with hearts and lives. God, I love you. Can you say that I love you, Jesus? I'm sure you're saying it right now at this altar. Jesus, I do love you. God, I love you with everything within me, every every piece of, of property, every, every investment, God, every moment of every day, every hour of every week, every week of every year. God, I love you. God, I stand before you right now. God, everything is yours, and you can have whatever you want. And God is not unrighteous. Amen. He loves us, man. This is a relationship between Jesus Christ and yourself. And it doesn't have a... I mean, it'll affect your marriage. It'll affect your fatherhood and your motherhood. It'll affect your business savvy. It'll affect your Christianity, your revelation. It'll affect how you read the Bible. It'll affect everything. But I'm telling you something. It's a relationship that has nothing to do with your wife or your checkbook or the world. Amen. What, what your relationship with Jesus Christ, do you agape me? Do you even like me, Peter? Amen. There are people here, you're not living for God. And I'll tell you something, God knows your sin. He knows your secrecy. He could pop you in a minute. But his long suffering is waiting for you to come to him and say, God, I'm, gonna, I'm throwing myself on a... This is dangerous, isn't it? It's dangerous to admit what kind of person we are. But you know, you, you begin to do that. God is going to do a miracle for you. Hallelujah. I wonder if we could stand in this audience. <laughs> I'll never understand. Amen. You know how people are. There is one guy who will keep to himself. He's going to keep his guns. He's going he's gonna to do what he's going to do. You don't understand me. You don't, you don't understand that. Uh, there, my, my life is complicated, man. And you know, there's no way, like like Thomas, there's no way I'm going to believe that that's, not until I'm convinced. So God needs to come to a point. He can convince you. You know what? I'm, I'm surprised everybody's at the altar to say, God, I love you. God, I love you. I love you more than anything in the world. See, I, I, like I said, I didn't come here to, to insult you, but to think, maybe to jar you a little bit. Because this is what it's all about. You can talk about all kinds of theology and history and econ, you know, economic, everything, all that stuff. But you know what? But it comes right down to right here. God loved the world, so he sent his son. There's a scripture here now. I'm going to read it. I know I, I said I would close, but um, <laughs> how do you know pre preachers don't always tell the truth? <laughs> if I can find it. 2 Corinthians 5.14. I want you to read this. I want to read it slow. Because, uh, uh, get this. It says, for the love of Christ compels us. It means it forces us to do what we don't want to do. Sometimes it's answering an altar call. Or giving that big check. You know what I mean? Or, or telling your boss, I cannot work those days, right? Sorry. It compels us. Why would someone do that? I, I remember as a, a young convert, I gave, I, a lot of times, I would give my whole paycheck to the church. Now, granted, I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids. I was pretty foot loose and fancy free, but it was still a sacrifice. The whole, the whole paycheck. It's for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus. This is, this is, what we're, this is how we look at it. We judge thus. That if one died for all, then all died. Pretty easy math, right? And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The real issue behind generosity is that the more God blesses me, the more I give. God didn't bless me to so that I can lift my, my lifestyle. Amen. God blessed me so that I could help his kingdom. That's what the gift of giving is. That's why the Bible says, amen, there's a gift of giving. 
Then there's also a grace of giving. That's the grace of giving that, uh, that, that a person get a raise. And you get, you get $100 more a month. You get $10,000 more a year. And that means that $10,000 more goes to the church. Because I'm not going to take this. What causes people to do that? The love of Christ compels me to confront my friend, my boss, my schoolmates. To get on the streets. To give up my Saturdays for outreach. The love of God compels me to get on my knees and pray. Right? It's all about the love of God. Amen. I'm going to leave it here. Tonight we're going to have a service. And I pray that you can find your way here in this place. But I'll tell you something, man. God really does care about you. He's proven that already. So that's not in question. What I what is profound to me in the Bible is, is that God looks at love and he measures it. Remember that woman that came in? She poured this oil on Jesus and she's crying and she's washing Jesus' feet with her tears and anointing him with very expensive oil. And this Pharisee is like, man, if this guy knew who it was that was touching him, he would rebuke her. She's a sinner. And Jesus asked him, you know what? There's a, a king that had two servants. One owed him 50 bucks, the other one owed him 5,000. He called them to account that neither one of them could pay. And he said, you're, you're forgiven. Both of you are forgiven of your debt. Which one loves him more? And the guy says, well, I, I guess the guy who owed more would love him more. And he says, exactly right, Simon. This woman whose sins are many. When I came in here, you didn't give me any perfume, which is customary. You didn't give me any, any perfume to put on. But she, she, she poured oil upon my head and anointed my, my head with, with, with spiked oil. You, you didn't wash my feet, which was customary, just a customary thing, amen. But, but this woman, she has not stopped from washing my feet with her tears and wiping it with her hair. Because he that is forgiven much, much loveth much. But if you never see yourself as a sinner, You'll never see yourself loving Christ that much. My family nearly revolted, man. They, they tried everything in their power to keep me from going to Africa because I was, I was going just 30, 45 minutes away from the Congo border where Ebola was outbreaking back in the day, back in the early 2000s. And they said, you're stupid. What are you doing? <laughs> Amen. People will not understand why you do what you do. I could go on, but I'm not going to. I'm going to give it faster. 